So hi everybody, welcome back. Um, we're gonna continue on today with our recap of Physics 46, where we go through all the chapters in the textbook that we covered this semester and summarize the most important points and concepts that you're gonna need to know uh, going into the final. So the next chapter to go over is chapter 26. And the topic here is DC circuits. So the first thing we're gonna go over um, from this chapter is resistors in series and parallel. So what happens when we connect uh, different resistors together in these different ways? Um, and let's start with resistors in series. So remember what it means to connect uh, devices in series. It means they're connected along a single path. So to illustrate this, we have one resistor Let's call it R1, connected to another one, R2. And we can have any number of these, so let's just kind of say dot, 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 and then the last will be Rn. So we have N resistors connected in series in this picture. And so um, let's label two points, A and B, okay, at the left and right ends here. And um, let's say what we can note about these resistors. So the first thing is that the currents are equal. In other words, whatever current is running through resistor one is the same as the current that's running through resistor two and so on. I1 is equal to I2 equals I3 and on until the last one. So that's currents equal. Um, as far as the voltages go, the voltages add. So in other words, if I want to know the total voltage uh, or the potential difference from point A to point B, that's across all the resistors, what I would do is I would add the voltage across resistor 1 to the voltage across resistor 2 and so on. Add all those voltages together to get the total. And as a side note, voltage is I times R. So that's the sort of calculation we would make for each individual voltage it's from Ohm's law. Okay, so... As far as the equivalent resistance goes, so this is the idea that we can take this big collection of resistors and think of it as essentially one resistor. The equivalent resistance is simply the sum, R1 plus R2 plus R3 and so on until we get to the last resistor. So, Resistances add when it comes to resistors wired together in series like this. Okay, now let's look at resistors in parallel. Okay, so the idea behind uh, connecting multiple devices in parallel is that each one has a separate path rather than everything being connected along the same path. So we'd have one resistor here and another one here. Notice how they each have their own path. And uh, we can have any number of these resistors in parallel. So let's say the last one over here is gonna be Rn. So you have R1, R2, and then however many resistors we have until the last one, which is Rn. Okay, so just like before, I'm gonna label two points, A and B, like this. And let's talk about what we can say for resistors in parallel. The first thing is voltage. So here, the voltages are equal. Okay, so let's, let's think about this. If I take the potential difference between points A and B, the idea is I can do that by going across resistor number one. So this is the path I'm thinking about. Or I could go straight across resistor number two or any of the resistors for that matter, I could do the last one. And we're always talking about here the potential difference between points A and B because that's the starting and end point uh, in each one of these paths I drew. So for that reason, V1, the voltage across resistor one, would be that voltage, but so would V2, the voltage across resistor two, and that applies to all of them until Vn. So that's just another way of saying that the voltages are equal. As far as the currents go, 
the currents add together. Currents add together. So, in other words, if I think about the total current, okay, flowing into this combination, that's going to equal the current that goes to resistor 1 plus the current that goes through resistor 2 and add up all of those currents until you get the last one. Uh, that is to say the currents add together. So the total current splits off. Some of it goes through each one of the resistors, but the total is just the sum of all the currents through those different resistors. That's the idea. And then as far as equivalent resistance goes, the way this works when you have resistors in parallel like this is that the inverse of R is what you have to combine. So one over REQ is equal to one over R1 plus one over R2 plus and so on until you get to the last one, one over Rn. So that's how resistances add together when you have resistors in parallel. It has to work this way. Okay, so the next topic is Kirchhoff's rules. And basically these rules are tools that you can use to analyze a circuit. And so it's pretty simple. There are two rules. Um, one of them is called the junction rule. And this states that the sum of currents going into a junction must equal the sum of currents going out of that junction. Okay, so as an equation, we could say, take the sum of all currents going in, that equals the sum of all currents going out. And to illustrate an example of this, um, let's say that this is our junction. So this is a point where um, multiple different uh, segments of wire are gonna meet. So if we have a current up here, let's say I1, a current in the middle, I2, and a current down here, I3, all going into that junction, let's say there's just one wire um, with a current exiting the junction, let's call that I4, then we know exactly how to relate these currents because we have three currents going into the junction. It's I1 plus I2 plus I3, and that must equal the only current that's going out of the junction, which is I4. Now, the reason this works in the first place is that charge is conserved. So any charge that's going into the junction must be going out if it's not gonna just build up at that junction. So the second rule, it's called the loop rule. And this is a statement about voltage. Okay, this says that the sum of all voltages in any closed loop of a circuit must equal zero. Okay, so here's the idea. We take the sum over some closed loop in the circuit of all voltages and we get zero. All right, so let's look at an example of this. Let's say this is our circuit. We have a battery connected to a resistor, connected to a capacitor, all in a closed loop. So we'll call the, the battery epsilon, resistor is R, and then the capacitor is C, like this. And the positive terminal of the battery is up here. The negative terminal is down here. So right away, we know which way the current is going to flow in the circuit. It's going to be flowing clockwise because it flows off the positive terminal and then loops back around to the negative terminal. And also based on that, we know that as far as the capacitor is concerned, we accumulate positive charge on the top plate because after all, 
the current is heading towards that top plate, and that's where positive charge moves, which means the bottom plate is negatively charged. So the loop rule here says that if we take the voltage across the battery, okay, so, so in other words, I want to start down here in this lower, um, this lower left corner and then go around the circuit uh, clockwise. We'll go across the battery first and then we'll go across the resistor first after that and then we'll go across the capacitor after that. So these three voltages have to add to zero according to the loop rule. Of course, here we're assuming there's no uh, resistance in the wires that connect everything. Anyway, the battery voltage is positive because we're going from the negative to the positive terminal, epsilon. Uh, the voltage across the resistor is negative because we're going in the direction of the current. And I times R is given by Ohm's law, so that's uh, the magnitude of the voltage. And then as for the capacitor, that's another negative voltage because we're going from the positive to the negative plate. And Q divided by C, that's going to give us uh, the size of that voltage. So that's our loop rule equation for this circuit. And actually, that brings us nicely to RC circuits. Because what we have here in this uh, picture is a charging RC circuit. So by... Um, Connecting the capacitor to the battery in this way, we are charging the capacitor. So that's what we're dealing with. And I'm not going to go through the derivation of these equations. Basically, if we solve the loop rule equation I wrote down here, we'll obtain Q as a function of time is equal to Q naught uh, 1 minus E to the minus T over tau. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about what these variables mean. Um, Q naught, that's our maximum charge. It's equal to epsilon times C. So what this equation is telling us is the uh, charge grows over time and eventually reaches this maximum value. This number tau is called the time constant. Okay, and the time constant tells us how quickly the capacitor charges and discharges. Okay, so tau is actually just equal to R times C. You take the product of the resistance and the capacitance, you get the time constant. All right, um, so this equation here, I'll put it in a box, tells us for a charging RC circuit, how the current, or sorry, how the charge as a function of time on the capacitor um, behaves. So the current as a function of time going through the circuit is given by this equation, I naught times E to the minus T over tau, where tau has the same meaning, it's our time constant, but this time I naught is equal to epsilon divided by R. That's the max current. And this is telling us that current uh, just decays as a function of time. So it starts at some maximum and then it decays away. So when we're dealing with a charging RC circuit, if I were to graph Q as a function of time, it would look like this. So we'd start at zero and then level off to some maximum. There's, uh, there's our maximum right there. And then if I were to plot out current as a function of time, okay, that would start off at a maximum and then exponentially decay from there. Okay, so that's what it looks like when we plot those two functions. So that applies to a charging RC circuit. All right, so now if we have a discharging RC circuit, and let's, let's actually just draw a little circuit diagram to show what that would look like. So if I have a capacitor, C, and the plates have some kind of charge on them, so plus Q and minus Q, 
And I just directly connect that to a resistor. So we'll leave the battery out of the circuit. Okay, here's what's gonna happen. Charge is gonna wanna flow off of this positive plate leading to a current going this way and then back around to the negative plate until overall there's no charge left. So the equations for a discharging circuit are as follows. Q is a function of time is equal to Q naught times E to the minus T over tau. And I is a function of time, that's the current, is equal to I naught times E to the minus T over tau. That's for discharging. And if we plot these out, well, they're both just exponentially decaying functions. So uh, when we're discharging, charge is a function of time. It starts at a maximum and then it exponentially decays from that point on. And current as a function of time does the same thing. Start at some maximum and then exponentially decay from there. And it's the same time constant, tau is equal to r times c, that characterizes how fast this decay happens. Okay, so that's it for chapter 26, um, which is all about DC circuits. So now let's move on to the next chapter. All right, so the next chapter is chapter 27. And the topic here is magnetism. So this was our introductory chapter to magnetism. So to start with the really basic stuff, um, what is a magnet? So all magnets have two poles. We call these poles north and south. And what we can say about these poles is that um, opposites attract. Just like with charge, opposites attract and like poles repel. Okay, so if I, if I take a bar magnet, um, let's say the north pole is on the left and the south pole is on the right like this, and I put it right next to another bar magnet where the, no, where the north pole is on the left and the south pole is on the right like this, well, I know they're gonna attract each other because I have the south and the north pole close together so those opposite poles will attract. So that's what we call magnetic attraction. On the other hand, if I just were to like, let's say flip the, uh, the second magnet around so that the south pole is on the left and the north pole is on the right like this. Well, now I have two south poles facing each other and I know that like poles repel. So we're gonna see repulsion, okay? So it's, Pretty simple when we think about what happens with bar magnets. So the next thing is to define a magnetic field. So magnetic fields, so the magnetic field B is another example of a vector field. So just like electric fields, this is an example of a vector field, meaning at every point in space, we assign a vector. That's the idea. So let's first talk about what the direction of a B field represents. The direction of B at a given point, at a given point in space, is the direction a compass needle would point if placed at that location. Okay, so that's that's how we interpret the direction of B. As far as the magnitude goes, well, the closer together the B field lines are. then the stronger, okay, i.e. greater magnitude, the B field is. 
So in that way, it, looks, it uh, works just like electric fields, where the closer together the lines are, the stronger the field is. So let's take the bar magnet as our example, where we have a north and a south pole. Let's sketch out what the B field lines look like. So they actually form loops. So the, the B field lines will come off the north pole like this and loop back around into the south pole as so. And it's totally symmetric, so the, the field lines will be doing the same thing on the other side. Again, coming out of the North Pole and then looping back around into the South Pole of the magnet. And again, the interpretation of the direction that these field lines are pointing is, if you placed a compass at some location, let's say up here, well, my B field line is essentially going to the left. That means the needle of my compass is going to be pointing to the left like this. Okay, if I put a compass, let's say, um, down here, that means the needle of that compass would be pointing straight down. That's what the B field line is indicating to me. All right, and in the same way, the strength of the B field is indicated by how closely packed the lines are. So for instance, if I'm looking at point one here, which is right under the South Pole, and then I just kind of pick some random point really far away from the magnet, let's say P2, because the B field lines are much more spread out at point two, that means the B field is much weaker at point two, i.e. it's stronger at point one. Okay. The last thing to say about B fields is there's an SI unit that we need to think about, and that's called the Tesla, or capital T for short. Okay, so before we go into the next topic, um, what I want to look at is a quick review of cross products. Because as you know, Cross products pop up all over the place when we talk about magnets, magnetic fields, magnetic forces, and really anything to do with magnetism. So let's say I have two vectors, A and B, and I want to find the cross product of A and B. So let's call C the vector we get when we take the cross product of A and B. So first, just note that C is a vector. When we take the cross product of two vectors, the result of that is another vector. That's what that's telling us. And that means the result of a cross product has a magnitude and a direction. So the magnitude of C is given by the following. We have the magnitude A times the magnitude B and then sine of the angle between the two vectors. Okay, so what you should have in mind is something like this. If this is vector B, this is vector A. The angle in between them, theta, that's what determines the magnitude of the cross product. Okay, as far as the direction is concerned, C is perpendicular to both A and B. And the way we determine the direction is we use the right hand rule. Okay, so if you recall the way this works is you take the fingers of your right hand and you point them in the direction of the first vector, which in this case is A. So take the fingers of your right hand and point them straight to the right. And then you curl them in the direction of the second vector, which in this case is B. So just take those fingers and curl them up a little bit. And you'll see that your thumb is pointing out of the page. So in this particular example, the vector B is out of the page. So here, let me write that again. C is out of the page. Okay. So now that we've reviewed cross products for a little bit, um, one place this comes uh, into play is when we look at magnetic forces. So magnetic fields, these B fields, they exert forces on moving charges. 
Okay, so whenever you have a moving charge in the presence of a magnetic field, there is some kind of force there. And there are generally two ways to think about this. Okay, so one way we can have moving charge is on kind of a large scale where we have a bunch of current running through a wire. So the magnetic force on a current carrying wire is given by force is equal to IL cross B. So the cross product is coming into play. Another way we can think about um, force on a moving charge is just a single charged particle. So the magnetic force on a moving charged particle, or a moving point charge, let's say, that's given by um, F is equal to QV cross B. So again, it's another cross product. So let's take a look at some specific examples here. What if we have a charge that moves perpendicular to a uniform B field? Okay, so let's take our B field to be coming out of the page like this. So there's B. And let's have our charge Q be moving, how about straight up like this? Okay, so if we apply the right hand rule, Q, V cross B, you would take your right hand, point your fingers in the direction of the velocity, which is straight up, and then you'd curl them in the direction of the B field, which is out of the page. If you do that, your thumb is pointing to the right, so that's the direction of our force. So notice how the force and the velocity are at right angles. This results in circular motion. Okay, so we're gonna get circular motion in this case. And actually, if I apply F equals MA to this charge, if I apply Newton's second law, Here's what we get. So the magnitude of the force is Q times V times B, and the angle between um, my velocity and my B field is 90 degrees. So QVB sine 90 is how I take the magnitude of the cross product in this case. And that's equal to M times A. But the acceleration of something moving in a circle like this, as we know, is V squared divided by R. So this is how we make calculations as to what the radius is, for example, of this circular motion, okay? The next case we wanna look at is what if uh, the charge also has a velocity component? Um, that's parallel to the B field. So let's kind of draw what this looks like. Okay, let's say that my B field is going straight to the right like this. And this is some kind of uniform B field just going to the right. And my charge is moving at an angle such that if I break its velocity into components, I'll have um, v perpendicular, which is perpendicular to the B field, but I'll also have a component that's parallel uh, to the B field. So that's what I was talking about. So if this is the case, this results in a path shaped like a helix. Okay? So the idea is, in the plane that's uh, perpendicular to the B field, the charge moves in a circle, but in the direction that's parallel to the B field, the charge just moves in a straight line path. So if you combine those two motions, 
you end up getting a helix, which is just a fancy way of saying it moves in a spiral like this. Okay, so the last thing to go through from chapter 27 is magnetic torque. So the idea is, just like magnetic fields can exert a force on something, in certain situations, they can also exert a torque. So in particular, we're looking at the magnetic torque on a current loop. So let's start with the formula. The torque, that's tau, is equal to mu cross B, so it's yet another cross product. B, of course, is the magnetic field. And mu is what we call the magnetic dipole moment. And so let's take a little bit of time to understand what this magnetic dipole moment thing is telling us. So, of course, the idea is we have some kind of loop of current. So imagine a wire, let's say, that's uh, sort of bent around into a circle like this, and then there's a current, I, circulating throughout that wire. So the magnitude of mu is given by n times i times a, where n is the number of turns of wire in the loop. So in other words, we don't have to just take a wire and then wrap it around itself one time. We could wrap it around a circle many, many times, and n is just that number. I is the current going through the loop. And then A, of course, is the area of the loop. So that's how we think about the magnitude of this magnetic dipole moment. As far as the direction goes, okay, the direction of mu is always perpendicular to the area or the surface um, of the loop. And the way we actually get the direction right is the right-hand rule. So we use the right-hand rule to get the direction. So the way this works is just take your right hand and curl your fingers around in the direction of the current. Okay, so if you do that for the picture that you see here, you're going to find that your thumb is pointing up. And so that is the direction of our mu vector in this case. Okay, so that's how you think about the magnetic dipole moment, mu. And again, if you just cross that with the B field, then you get the torque on this loop of current. So that's it for chapter 27. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one. Okay, so the next chapter is chapter 28. And the topic here is sources of magnetic fields. Okay, so in the previous chapter, what we talked about are some of the effects that magnetic fields can have on moving charges. So for instance, we have magnetic forces and magnetic torques. Um, but what we haven't addressed yet is where these magnetic fields come from in the first place. Like, why do they exist in the first place? And so the most general statement we can make is that B fields are produced, ultimately, by moving charges. I.e. electric currents. Okay, so the, the simplest case of this that we can think of is a current running through a long straight wire. Okay, so something like this. So the B field lines, in this case, are gonna form circular loops. around the wire.
And if you want to get the direction exactly right, you can use the right hand rule. But what we should be picturing is surrounding the wire are these circular loops showing us which way the B field is going. Okay? Now, as for the magnitude of the B field, okay, there's a formula. And you can take this to be an experimental result that the magnitude of the B field is given by some constant called mu naught times i divided by 2 pi r, where r is our distance away from the wire. So this is telling us that as we get further away from the wire, as r increases, that the strength of the B field will decrease, which makes intuitive sense. Now, by the way, this constant mu naught, this is the first time we've seen it uh, in this review lecture. So just to remind you, it's 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7. And the units are Tesla times meters over amps. Okay, and this thing is called um, the permeability of free space, but we often just refer to it as mu naught. Okay, so with that said, let's move on to Ampere's law. And Ampere's law is kind of similar to Gauss's law in a lot of ways, because what we're doing is we're relating um, B fields to their sources, which as we said, um, to their sources, let me write that again, to their sources, which are currents, right? So it's a relationship between a current and the B field that it produces. So the statement is that the integral of a B field uh, over a closed loop is proportional to, so it's proportional to the current enclosed by that loop. Okay, so Let's get a sense of this uh, with an example. So suppose we have a long straight wire segment and we're looking at it um, face on. So rather than seeing the wire from the side as I drew it up here, instead what we're gonna see is the wire face on so that the current is coming out of the page at us like this. Okay, so we know the B field uh, is circular loops around that wire, something like this. And again, try using the right-hand rule. Take your thumb, point it out of the page in the direction of the current, okay? And then the fingers of your right hand are gonna be curling like I'm showing you here, which is um, counterclockwise. So that's our B field. Okay, Ampere's law is saying, if we take some kind of closed loop Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna draw that loop with a dashed line right here. Okay, and we integrate the B field over that closed loop. That integral is gonna be proportional to the current that we're enclosing with that loop. Okay, so here. Let's call this little piece of the path DL. And by the way, we can call this loop the Ampurian loop. That's the name of this thing. So if we put Gauss's law into a more mathematical expression, B dot DL over a closed loop. So the integral of B dot DL over a closed loop is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. Okay, that's Ampere's law and that's what it says. Okay, so when it comes to Ampere's law, it turns out there are certain types of symmetry that we focus on because if we're not really focused on these special cases, um, using Ampere's law to calculate a B field is actually quite difficult. It's only straightforward to do 
in these uh, special cases. So let's go over that. So the first one we want to look at is infinitely long straight wires. Now, of course, there's more than one way you can have an infinitely long straight wire that has a current running through it. So, for instance, we could sort of look at different current densities that are possible inside of the wire. But the general problem in, of an infinitely long straight wire is something that you should know how to deal with. Okay? The next one is infinitely long solenoids. So just remember what a solenoid is. It's a cylinder with a wire wrapped around it many, many times. Uh, that's a solenoid. Okay, the next is a toroid. This is a little bit hard for me to draw. I'm gonna be really testing my artistic abilities here. But essentially think of it as a solenoid that's sort of bent back around in on itself. So now it's shaped like a donut, okay? So what we're gonna do is wrap a wire many, many times around that donut shape. That's a toroid. And then the last one is infinite current sheets. Okay, so it's exactly what it sounds like, just an infinitely uh, large sheet with some kind of current running through it. These are the cases we need to know. So there are four of them. As long as you're comfortable with each of these, you should be good to go as far as Ampere's law is concerned, okay? So the next thing is the Biot-Savart law. Which essentially is just another way to calculate a B field. All right, but it's not as limited, oops, it's not as limited as um, Ampere's law because we don't need a certain special symmetry in order to use it. So here's what the, the Biot Savart law says dB, which is a vector is equal to mu naught times i dl cross r hat divided by 4 pi r squared. So let's really spell out what this is saying. There are a lot of variables here. So the general thing you should be thinking about is we've got some kind of wire that carries a current, and it doesn't have to have any particular shape. Um, and let's indicate the current i going through the wire right there. Okay, so... The question I want to answer is, what is the B field at some point next to the wire? Let's call that point P. So in the framework of the Biot-Savart law, the way I approach this is I take the wire and I divide it up into little elements of current. So this is my current um, element. And the way I think about this current element is it's a vector the direction is just the direction the current is going. So I'm going to show my direction is just whichever way the current happens to be flowing at that point. And that vector is called dl. Okay. There's another vector that comes into play here, which is r. And basically, r goes from the current element to the point where I'm trying to calculate the B field. Okay? So... There's a few other things that go into this equation. Um, notice how we're doing dl cross r hat, not r. So r hat is a unit vector. That means length one in the direction of r. Okay, and on the bottom where you see r squared, and that's not a vector, it's just some kind of scalar, r squared. This is referring to the magnitude of that vector that we just showed r. So, in other words, this is the distance between the current element and the point. Okay, so... 
db is a little infinitesimal bit of b field um, created by this little current element dl. So of course, if we want the total b field, and not just some small part of it, um, we need to integrate. And we need to integrate over all current elements. So in practice, what we're doing is the integral over all my dBs gives me the total B field, okay, at a given point. All right, so the last uh, chapter that we covered in this class was chapter 29, Faraday's Law. So before we can talk about Faraday's Law, we first needed to define something called magnetic flux. And conceptually, what magnetic flux tells you is how many B-field lines are going through a surface. Okay, so if we have a lot of B-field lines passing through a surface, then there's a lot of flux. Uh, if we have no B-field lines going through a surface, then there's no flux. That's the idea. The picture you should have in your head is something like this. We have got some kind of surface. It really can be anything you want. And we have a B-field. The lines maybe are going like this. And you see how some of them are passing through the surface. Now, the surface itself has something called an area vector, dA. And it's always pointing perpendicular to the surface, like this. So, the magnetic flux, which is given by uh, phi sub b, is the integral over the surface of b dot dA. So, it works in the exact same way that electric flux works. We're just applying the same idea now to magnetic fields. Okay? So, that takes us to electromagnetic Induction. So if the magnetic flux is changing, and um, in particular, I want to think about the magnetic flux through a loop of wire. So if we have a changing magnetic flux through a loop of wire, a current is going to be induced. So even if we don't have a battery or anything like that, we'll still induce a current in the wire just because there's a changing magnetic flux through the wire. And Faraday's law tells us exactly how that works. So here's what um, Faraday's law says. The magnitude of the induced EMF or voltage, these are the same thing, is equal to N times the derivative with respect to time of magnetic flux. And here we're taking absolute values because we're not going to get the direction from this. We'll just take absolute values. By the way, N, what is that? That's just the number of turns of wire in the coil. Or in the loop, you could say. This derivative is the time rate of change of magnetic flux. So the idea is, the faster your magnetic flux is changing, the larger the EMF will be induced, and then the larger the current you'll get um, as a result. Now, Lenz's law is sort of the counterpart of this, because with Faraday's law, what can we do? We can calculate the induced current. 
okay, just using the fact that that same EMF is I times R, okay, that's Ohm's law. Lenz's law tells us something about the direction of the induced current. Okay? And what Lenz's law says is the EMF induced in the loop opposes the change in magnetic flux. Okay, so with Faraday's law and Lenz's law together, you can figure out what the induced current is as well as which direction it's going. So to say a little bit more about this, what we have so far from Faraday's law is that a changing, oops, a changing magnetic flux Okay, that's the phi B quantity that leads to an induced EMF. So the question is, what are the different ways that magnetic flux can be changing? And to understand that, so here, different ways magnetic flux can change. Well, if we go back to the basic definition of magnetic flux, again, it's something about the way field lines are going through a surface, and it's given by B dot dA. Well, one way magnetic flux can be changing is if the total area of the loop is changing. So, of course, if you make a bigger area, then there will be more B field lines going through it. Number two is that the magnitude of the B field changes in some way. So that's B. So even if you don't change anything about the area of the loop, um, if you make the B field that that loop is inside of stronger or weaker as time goes on, then you're changing the flux. And finally, the last option is the angle between uh, your B field and that dA vector, that area vector we indicated, let's call that angle uh, theta, that can change as well. And what, what this actually amounts to is the loop is rotating. So if we imagine the loop is rotating in the magnetic field, um, then, of course, you're going to have a changing flux, and you're going to have an induced EMF. And in fact, this is the idea behind an electrical generator. Okay? So this is everything we've covered. In this semester. So take a minute to appreciate all the hard work you've done to understand these things. And I do want to leave you with one final thought before this is over. All right. So as you know, we lost a lot of days this semester, um, not only because of the coronavirus, but also because of the power outages that happened earlier in the semester. And that means we didn't get through as many uh, chapters as I had hoped. And actually, the last chapter that I was planning on doing is really important. It actually ties everything that we've learned so far this semester all together in one nice little package. So this is not going to be covered on the final, but I do want to give you sort of the 10 to 15 minute brief summary of Maxwell's equations. That's chapter 31. Okay, because I think this really um, nicely ties everything together. So Maxwell's equations are a complete description so they completely describe any possible E field and B field that you could see. So E and B fields generally can be described by Maxwell's equations. 
And what I want to do here is list them out for you. There are four. And some of them you've seen before. So for instance, let's do equation number one. This is just Gauss's law. So we know how this goes. Um, the integral of e dot dA over some closed surface is equal to Q enclosed divided by epsilon naught. So we've already seen this before, but what I want to look at is what is the basic idea behind this equation? What is it telling us? Well, the basic idea is that um, charges produce electric fields. Because, of course, we have something about electric charge on the right-hand side of the equation. We have something relating to electric fields on the left-hand side. And that tells you there's a connection. The, the charges actually create the electric field in some sense. So, number two, Gauss's law, but for magnetism. So we didn't even talk about this at all. Um, but it actually is a very simple equation, and it has a really interesting consequence to it. So the left-hand side is the integral over a closed surface of b dot dA. Now, you might expect that on the right-hand side, there's something about current, because, of course, we know currents are what produce magnetic fields. But actually, the right-hand side is just zero. So b dot dA is equal to zero. What is that telling us? Well, the basic idea here is that there are no magnetic charges. And I'm going to put that in quotes, so no magnetic charges. So in other words, all magnets have both a north and a south pole. And they can't be separated. OK, so to clarify, you might be asking, OK, what if I took a bar magnet and I just snapped it in half? Wouldn't I have a north pole and a south pole? Well, the answer is no, actually. If you take a bar magnet and you snap it in half, now you have two different magnets, and each one of them has a north and a south pole. And if you just keep breaking them into smaller pieces, each one of those pieces is going to have a north pole and a south pole. You can't actually isolate or separate uh, the north and south poles. But with electric charges, if we go back to equation number one, Gauss's law, you can, right? You can have positive charge by itself or negative charge by itself which is why Gauss's law for electric fields, equation number one, looks the way it does. But Gauss's law for magnetism is just B dot dA is equal to zero. Okay, that's the idea. There's, there's no magnetic charge. Any magnet has a north and a south pole. You can't separate them. Okay, equation number three. This is something we've seen before. This is Faraday's law. And we're used to writing this equation in a certain way in terms of like the induced EMF. But there's another completely equivalent way that we can write this, which is the integral over a closed loop of E dot dL. That is equal to minus the time derivative of B dot dA. And actually, if we just sort of look at the left and right sides, E dot dL, if you integrate that, in other words, if you integrate the electric field over some path, that's the same as a voltage or an EMF. And B dot dA is just magnetic flux. So it's really the same equation we've seen before, just written in terms of the E field and the B field. But when we think of it this, in these terms, um, there's an idea that I want you to take away from this. And that basic idea is that chain, oops. So the basic idea is that changing uh, B fields create or produce E fields. So that's the basic idea behind 
this equation. Okay, number four. This is the last of Maxwell's equations. Well, this is Ampere's law. And you might think you've seen Ampere's law before because we know, that, of course, that um, B dot DL integrated over a closed loop is equal to mu naught times I enclosed. That's the Ampere's law that we've grown to know and love up until this point. But I kind of lied to you because there's a second term that I've never mentioned yet, which is this mu naught times epsilon naught times the time derivative, ddt, of integral e dot dA. Okay, so this second term right here, this was added by Maxwell himself. Okay, so Ampere's law, without that second term, that's how um, Ampere developed the law. Maxwell realized that in order for the equations of electricity and magnetism to be consistent, you have to add that second term, which involves a changing electric field. Okay, so what is the basic idea behind this that we can sort of take away? Well, the basic idea is that um, B fields, okay, that's what you see um, on the left side of the equation, something about a B field, they're created by electric currents, we already know that, but they can also be created by changing E fields. Okay, so if you look at equation number three, Faraday's law, that says a changing B field can create an E field. Ampere's law, when we add this second term to it, tells us that a changing E field can create a B field. So it goes both ways, in other words. Okay, so the last ingredient here, before we put everything all together, is called the Lorentz force. And this is something that we've seen before, actually, because this is the force that a charge feels in E or B fields. Maybe there's both an E field and a B field. It still describes the force. So this force is given by Q times E. And this is what we call the electric force. That's the force that the E field is exerting onto the charged particle. And then we have QV cross B that we have to add to that because this is what we call the magnetic force. That's the force that the magnetic field exerts on a charged particle. So this is really the complete theory of what we call classical um, electromagnetism. So we've already seen all of the ingredients, okay? So the first um, ingredient is we can calculate any field, whether it's electric or um, magnetic, so any E or B field, using Maxwell's equations. And then we can calculate the effect of these fields. Okay, the effect these fields have on charges um, by using the Lorentz force. Okay, and so really, it's all contained in these equations. There's nothing more to say than what's already here. Not to say that it's always easy to apply these ideas, but this is really a complete picture. And the last thing that we wanna say here is that we can use this complete picture to understand what light is, okay? So light itself, the light that you see with your eyes, 
In addition to that, radio waves, ultraviolet, infrared light, these are all different types of light. Um, but what light really is, is it's an electromagnetic wave. In other words, light itself can be understood in terms of Maxwell's equations. There's a whole lot we could say about this. I want to just sketch out the basic idea. So here it is. Let's say we have some kind of charge, Q. And that charge is oscillating um, up and down. Something like this. Okay, so we know that charges create electric fields. But if the charges are moving around, well, the electric field is also moving around in some sense. So what we have here is a changing E field. All right, but one thing we learned from Maxwell's equations is that a changing E field gives you a B field. And that B field is also gonna be oscillating up and down. So now we have a changing B field. Okay, but Maxwell's equations also say that if you have a changing B field, that creates an E field. So now I'm gonna have a changing E field. And what does that create? A changing B field. And we could keep going with this forever, but that's really what light is, okay? So what light is, is a pattern of oscillating, um, yeah, of oscillating E and B fields. And that's what we call a wave, um, which move um, away from the source. So to give you a rough sketch of what this looks like, this is our E field oscillating up and down like this. And this is our B field. It actually oscillates in a different direction, but you can see it there. So this is used to represent E. This is used to represent B. And you can see each one is oscillating, but that pattern of oscillations moves in a certain direction which in this case is to the right. So there's a whole lot more you could say about that. You could spend many, many years studying electromagnetic waves and understanding how they work, but I'm just gonna leave it at that. And that's the end of the semester, everybody. So um, just wanna say it's been a pleasure to get to know all of you. Um, I hope you're all doing well out there. And I'm really looking forward to the time when we can all get back together in the classroom and have face-to-face -face classes. But until then, um, try to make the most out of online. Uh, do the best you can with that. So I hope you all have a great summer. Good luck on your finals and take care.